Yeah, so my name is Wilhelm Verwurt, and in South Africa, even today, the surname Verwurt is associated with Dr. H. F. Verwurt, who was Prime Minister during the 50s and the 60s, really at the time of the heyday of apartheid. So for many black South Africans, he would personify the evil of that system. And I have to find a way to deal with that, not to run away from it, not to deny it, but to find a way to address it in a constructive way. Turn right onto unpaved road. So I've been on a journey of reconciliation, but in the process, I basically, I think, moved away from my family, emotionally and even, you know, politically. And so this journey was basically saying reconciliation has to be inclusive. Nobody can be demonized. Nobody can be excluded. And am I willing to include my own family, including my father and my grandfather, despite my deep, deep differences with them at a political level? Well, welcome to another caring conversation. Today I'm sitting in the home of an old friend of mine, John and his wife Shannon van Breda in Paul, just under the Hottentots Hollands Mountains in the background. The conversation today is with another mutual friend of ours, Wilhelm Verwut. We are going to have a conversation about his latest book, Lutbande in Donke Teiskoms. Verwut, my journey through family betrayals. But I have to say, Wilhelm, Blutbande, this kind of had a more visceral feel to it. Now, why did you change the title? Well, to be honest, I didn't. <laughs> yeah. It was not my preference, but I think there was a sense from the publishers that uh, this title wouldn't work as well with an English audience. And I sort of reached a point where I didn't really try and, you know, convince them otherwise. And I sort of said, okay, I'll go with the flow of it. But, mm. but for me, there was something quite visceral, mm. visceral about the title and mm. blood ties would have done it probably yeah. for me. Um, mm. But I was able at least to bring in the subtitle in the English version, mm. Which, mm. which highlighted the theme of family betrayal. Mm. And that was sort of some progress, at least. Yeah. And perhaps just to explain to folk, you know, Wilhelm and I go back 25 years, and he was very helpful to me when I was going through a particular crisis. We had, it was soon after the elections of 94. We were very idealistically wanting to implement the Reconstruction and Development Program. And I was greatly inspired by the work of Manfred Max Nierf, a Chilean development economist. And... It was wonderful until money started flowing and then as soon as there was money available and funding, you know, dynamics got rather sour and the whole organization now just went into fragmentation and decline. And um, it was quite a, a huge blow for me personally and professionally. And, and Wilhelm happened to be a member. He had joined the organization. And I have to confess, having a certain measure of kind of hesitation, you know, I'm not sure if it would as part of our membership was going to kind of help, given the fact that we were trying to really throw off the grave clothes of apartheid in the past. But boy, did he help me. He really brought me back into a deeper sense of how much longer we needed to go through this kind of travail in this country. Now, I'm wanting our conversation to kind of go this way, because at the beginning of my book, I've got a quote from Ben Ockrey. Stories are the secret reservoir of values. Change the stories that individuals and nations live by and tell themselves, and you can change the individuals and nations. If they tell themselves stories that are lies, they will suffer the future consequences of those lies. If they tell themselves stories that face their own truth, they will free their histories for future flowering. But you are uniquely someone who has journeyed an excruciatingly painful path to face your own truth, both at an individual, personal level, yeah. and as someone who's a direct descendant of the person who has come to embody, perhaps, more than anyone else, a false narrative, a false story, as you would see it, as I would see it, of nationhood. Mm. Henrik Franz Wood. Thank you, John, and thank you for this invitation mm. to reflect deeply about what this kind of journeying is about. And I do resonate with that quote. I mean, I've done a lot of work in the last couple of decades around storytelling and the, the challenge of finding stories that are humanizing instead of dehumanizing. Mm. 
Uh, I also have learned in retrospect and with, with a lot of uh, introspection that the challenge sometimes is that what, what we refer to as lies in retrospect can be very convincing in the present moment. Mm. I remember, is it Wimpy de Klerk who said, apartheid was darkness masquerading as light. Mm. And I've, I've held on to that because I think my grandfather in the, in the early days of my childhood, my socialization as a teenager even into a sense of Afrikaner mm -hmm. nationalist cultural identity, he was revered. Mm -hmm. And in fact, today he is still revered in conservative mm -hmm. Afrikaner nationalist mm -hmm. circles. And so there's a, almost like a halo mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, around him because of the way he gave his life when he was assassinated in, in 1966 for this cause of Afrikaner nationalism in competition and conflict with English uh, colonialism. Mm. So there's definitely this, this aura of, of almost sanctification around him. Mm. And, and I have had to be exposed to the pain of black South Africans mm. on the receiving end of his policy of so-called separate mm. development mm. Uh, to become aware of what that uh, reality really was and, and to expose the lie. Mm. Um, and I think because of this personal connection with, mm. with him as the prime minister at that time, when people spoke about their anger and their bitterness mm. about apartheid, they often would refer to him. Mm. And then it becomes very personal because mm. he's not just a politician, he's also my mm. grandfather. He fed you on his lap with, a, with yeah. milk when you were a kid. Yeah, well, I mean, it's in, in my, in my uh, research for the latest mm. book, I actually looked with new eyes at a very familiar family picture, which is on the wall of the family mm. beach house in Betty's Bay. And it's a picture that was taken for Heisgenoot, which is this lovely Afrikaans word for this almost like homely companion, yeah. you know, is this kind of uh, cultural kind of icon yeah. almost. Mm. But they took a lot of pictures at that time when the Republic was five years old. It was a big celebration, 1966, mm. uh, 31st of May. Mm. So around that time, you know, there was lots of different uh, pictures taken, but one of those pictures included me sitting on his lap as one of his grandchildren. And I just happened to be this little baby on his lap. Mm. And what struck me when I looked at it more closely was that he was literally holding a bottle of milk. Mm. Now my mom tells me that what actually happened was that I started to cry <laughs> when they were trying to, you know, take this picture and she was standing there with a milk bottle and he ended up taking the milk bottle and he looked actually quite relaxed with it. Yeah. And so in my reflection on him, mm. uh, in my latest, mm. you know, turning of the spiral, as it were, mm. I've actually looked at this as a very unusual, almost maternal image. Mm. Uh, but what it does open up is the whole question around what did I imbibe with not just my mother's mm. milk, but mm. with my grandfather's milk. Mm. And it has challenged me not to distance myself from him too easily. You know, there's more of him in me. Mm. There's more of him in my bones, as it were, not just in my blood. Uh, and that I need to face that so that I am now more cautious when I speak about him as mm. somebody who was misguided, somebody who had this illusion of mm. separate freedoms, somebody who was really fundamentally uh, um, mis misled by his own beliefs. I'm more careful because I know that I'm part of that. Mm. Um, and that's why I need to look at him mm. and when I expose the lie and I look for the life, then I need to also be quite humble about how I do that. Mm. I, I have to say that in the process of doing that kind of mm. questioning and, and probing and, and uh, mm. grappling with what the truth really is, I was deeply influenced by, by a lot of, of, of engagements with black South Africans, mm. going back to the 80s, mm. during the 90s, and now increasingly also with, with mm. people that I share our village mm. with and friends. Mm. And they often are the kind of midwives of the truth to me, uh, in a very relational Ubuntu mm. kind of way, mm. where, where they would never ask me and, and in fact, they would explicitly say that we're not asking you to reject your grandfather. Really? Mm. I mean, it's beautiful, actually, when you think about it, that for, within a kind of cultural mm. context where people do have a very mm. real sense of, of ancestors. Mm. And they would almost say, he's my ancestor, you know, and in our culture, we, we're not mm. disrespectful. 
mm. of our ancestors. So the question to me then was really not about what, mm. how can you reject your grandfather, it's rather what can you do with your life that's mm. different to what mm. he did. Yeah. And how can you, in a sense, take responsibility for mm. the legacy of his mm. lie? And not to have to live you know, the consequences of a, what really you now see yeah. was a lie, Victor, even yeah. though people did believe yeah. it. You talk about milk, the other strong symbolic metaphor of substance is blood, and that's yeah. why I like the title Blut Banda. Yeah. And in your book you begin by <clears throat> describing your visit to Oranya. Mm. Some people would say, from my English liberal speaking background, Oh, you know, just as well that Sofendus got rid of him. Imagine mm. how worse mm. things could have become mm. had he lived. And was there the hand of God in that? Mm. No. That act of making, in a sense, a martyr of him mm. was actually something which probably contributed more. And it might yeah. be even good for you to read that passage mm. of when you talk about mm. going to Oranya, the place where your grandfather is memorialized. Yeah. Okay, so we, we're talking about really a, a quite a, an important moment in my own journey mm. where I was able to go to that house in Urania with a close colleague and somebody I, I got to know during the Truth and Reconciliation mm. Commission, mm. Uh, Professor Pumla Gubordo Marigizela, mm. and she wrote that amazing book on Eugene yeah. de Kock, A Human Being Died That Night. So uh, like a very tutu-like yeah. person in her spirit. And she was interested to come with me to Urania because she was interested to understand really what was going on there. And so when we visited Urania, we ended up going through this house where there's a lot of things on display. Um, and so I'm walking with her through this. I mean, she understands political history, political trauma. Uh, and some of those uh, memories that she had of him, of course, would have been very different, you know, memories of dancing in the street on the day mm -hmm. that he was assassinated. And then we find ourselves in front of a display cupboard with the clothes my grandfather had been wearing on the day of his murder. Mm -hmm. Besides the old-fashioned formal work outfit, there are familiar pictures of him as Prime Minister. There are a few walking sticks in the left corner, and at the bottom, his watch, his wallet, a few writing utensils, and a copy of the official program of his state funeral. His shoes are placed next to his neatly folded trousers. The jacket is marked with four red flags where the knife struck. The white shirt doesn't need any pointers. The blood stains are diluted, but clearly visible. In the right corner is a line from a speech he gave on the day of the covenant in 1958, the year he took up the highest political office. We are not fighting for money or possessions, we are fighting for the life of a nation. And there's a picture of, of Dimitri Tsafendas as well next yes. to that, you know. And if I were to give a title to your book, it would be Getting Rid of the Blood, mm. both in a literal sense, because then you go on to describe how your Omar repeatedly had to try and wash the blood out of the shirt, mm. and the stain was still there. Yes. Yes. And yes. how that, when there is blood spilt, when it does happen, Things are taken to another level where it's not just manageable by human kind of negotiation. Was this for you your entry into that cave? And I have in mind, you know, Joseph Conrad's The Hero's Journey, you know, mm. where we start from a familiar place. Mm. In that process of disorder, when you have to let go of the mm. familiar, we've got to leave even our mentors behind. You have to go into that dark mm. cave. For me, the, the cave experience or this kind of disorientating, disorienting uh, experience really happened in the mid-80s when mm. I was studying in Holland. Mm. Ironically, not that far from where my grandfather was born really? and where from where they came, you know, to come to South Africa mm. at the time of the, 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 Anglo, the so-called mm. Anglo-Boer War. But so there was a, a nice synchronicity about being in this space where, where he really came from. But, but I was confronted during that time with the life experience of, of fellow students mm. and books. I mean, I remember the book by uh, Donald Woods about mm. Steve Biko. And a number of things in the media started to make me aware that the, the truth that I grew up with was really, you know, a lie. Uh, and mm. the truth that I grew up to believe in was really a lie. Mm. So, so that was the, the initial disillusionment. Um, but, and, and then almost like a distancing from, from my family, mm. uh, also emotionally. Uh, 
Mm. I think what happened with this recent visit to Urania and with this writing of this book and going into the diaries of my grandmother, speaking to my own mother, hearing that story about the washing of the clothes, mm. I think I was confronted more with almost my, what is my connection with this mm. family, you know, and even emotionally, how do I really connect with mm. this? Yeah. So it was almost like a, a turn of the of mm. the, the wheel, where it's almost coming back to where I started, no, yeah. but with a, with a different mm. with a set new, of eyes. With, an excel, with a new tonic, you know, the toxic somehow transformed to a tonic. With an inspiration, yeah. something, yeah. something healing. Yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah. You think of it in those terms, because yeah. you talk about restorative justice. Yeah. And, I mean, people say, what's another good way of understanding restorative justice? Healing. Yeah. Well, I mean, this is what for me is one of the, hopefully one of the key themes that comes mm. through this book is that I was only enabled to do that because of the generosity of spirit and the midwifery of black South Africans, mm. people of color, mm. who've been on the receiving end of my grandfather's policies, mm. my involvement in apartheid. Mm. But somehow there was this uh, generosity of spirit, mm. largeness of heart, mm. Mm. Uh, that, that basically said, we're not going to reject you as a person, mm. even though you carry his genes in your blood, mm. or in, your, in your veins. But the question really becomes then, what are you willing to do with it? Mm. So it's almost like then you become even Archbishop Tutu, you know, like he's your grandfather, he's your grandfather, mm. he's your grandfather, accept it. Mm. Don't run away from it. The mm. question is, what are you willing to do with that legacy? Mm. Mm. So it's almost like that then becomes the, mm. the encouragement mm. to go back to try and understand him, mm. to open my heart to them without feeling that I'm compromising Mm. the fundamental truth of my moral mm. and spiritual and political mm. opposition to what, what he mm. stood for. But somehow at a human level, mm. it's, it's more possible. Mm. And, and to have Pumla Gubodo Marikizela yeah. with me in that house yeah. and hearing about some of these mm. uh, experiences my mum had with the suit, mm. and then she would say, but I, I feel for your mum. Yeah. She wasn't necessarily have, being empathetic towards my grandfather, but that somehow she was able yeah. to connect with my mother. Yeah. And that, yeah. that spirit of, of almost yeah. undeserved empathy yeah. Uh, yeah. for me has become this almost, yeah. like you say, a tonic or the, yeah. the energy that yeah. has, has enabled yeah. me to come home yeah. uh, in the darkness of, yeah. of what he stands for and what my name represents. You know, it's interesting because in preparation for this, I was coming down from Joburg to, to Cape Town and, I th and the sort of the thought occurred to me, well, let me go and pay a visit. To, and I have to say again to mm. Urania, because 10 years ago, I went there and I actually felt like I was, in a sense, betraying our friendship mm. by doing so. But having read your book, I thought, mm. well, this is it's a good preparation. Yeah. So mm. I went and a, you introduced me to your cousin, Carl mm. Bosch of the Fourth. Uh, I met Franz de Klerk, who I'd met mm. 10 years ago, because I was very interested in Orania for all sorts of other reasons, the fact mm. that they're very into green building and mm. ecological sustainability and all these things that matter to me. But then I also made sure, because you talk a lot in your book about your friendship of these black neighbours of yours, Emily yeah. and, and, and Naledi. Yeah. And needless to say, I mean, as you probably expect, they were very warm mm. and very open. In your book, you talk about in the black Jesus being crucified mm. because it's Albert Latouli, an image of him, a likeness of him hanging on the cross, the black Jesus. And you have these two centurion guards, one of them with a distinctive visage of your grandfather, mm. piercing him That's with it. a lance, the blood. Mm. Shocking mm. must that be for your family, your father. That that really is is the the counterpoint to my sort of engagement with the family blood, as it were, in the more literal sense, or the the meaning of the blood of his death. You know, which is another sort of very important, mm. symbolic, strong, almost sacred mm. kind of bond between us. And definitely, my father and his relationship with his father. I think there's this kind of sacred bond that's mm. also. Uh, strengthened by this, uh, the way in which he died. But, but so that's one way of, of, of speaking about blood. But then there's the, 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 the counter, the, the other side of it, namely we have blood on our hands mm -hmm. for what we do to fellow human beings in this mm -hmm. country. And if you then add the Christian face to that, then you can start to actually say, well, you know, what you do to the least of me, you know, what you do, you know, Saul prosecuting, you know, the Christians and the voice saying, Saul, Saul, why are you prosecuting me? You know, so this idea that in the mm. 
cutting out of, 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 of dehumanization and injustice, we're actually crucifying Christ. So, so the, 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 the black Christ painting actually is quite biblical, mm. even though it's very difficult mm. to take. Mm. Um, but that has been for me the icon mm. that I've sat with the most, mm. Uh, mm. in addition to the one of me sitting on my grandfather's mm. lap with the milk bottle. Mm. But to almost sit with these two images and say, okay, I'm, I somehow have to be able to hold on to both. Mm. And then you, it feels like you're being stretched beyond what you're able mm. to bear. Um, mm. And I wouldn't use the word in a strong sense, but there is something in the Christian tradition of Jesus saying, you, you have to take up your cross mm. if you want mm. to follow me. Mm. So I don't want to dramatize it, but there is a sense in which mm. that kind of language and imagery mm. has become more real to me. Mm. Because in the doing of that, mm. in not rejecting my family, not rejecting my grandfather, but also holding on to, to the pain that we are responsible for and listening to the Mabiba family, listening to Temba and Pumna and various other people, holding on to that as well, there is a kind of a humanization that, that takes place. So there's a kind of a deepening of my sense of what it means mm. to to have this embodiment and that there's meaning in this embodiment. And so that the, the crucifixion becomes then the prelude to the, to the new life. So, mm -hmm. so, so, so for me, those deep mysteries have become mm -hmm. actually much more experiential, mm -hmm. much more believable, mm -hmm. uh, having been on this kind of journey. Mm -hmm. um, but one reflection I have, which is in a sense is not, it's where we come in, your friends, other members of the Christian community, you know, listening to Carl and his wife Anya and their story, and mm. you can see, that, you know, they've got their you know, ch challenges. Seeing, and it was lovely to, you know, Anya to see kids happily riding mm. their bicycles on the street without fear. Mm. But then I felt there was something missing. There were no black kids there. Yeah. And I just thought, now this is not because I wanted to be politically correct, because when yeah. I then spent time with my lady and Emily and Lelo, I asked them, I said, what's it like, you know, how did you feel about having mm. a furvut mm. next door to you? Lelo, she said, John, can you ask Will Helen, how did he feel <laughs> when he moved into Lindock village and having us as neighbors? Mm. So for me, my first sense was, I'm grateful that we will have a black family as a neighbor, because that's exactly what I'm trying to get away from this white Afrikaner Stellenbosch cocoon that I grew up in. I don't want to go back to that. So, and across the road, we had people, you know, of color. Uh, and not you know. just because it was political, because your own sense of humanization. Well, this, so, so then, it, it well, exactly, so that, so that this idea that the lie of apartheid was that we are so different that we cannot be together. Mm -hmm. You know, we have to be separate. Mm -hmm. And of course, the opposite is the truth that we can only be human yeah. if we're actually living in our diversity mm -hmm. together. Yeah. Um, so so Leindach is a small sort of humble attempt to mm -hmm. sort of embody that. And so I, I'm very excited to be part of that. Mm -hmm. I was cautious, of course, at the yeah. beginning how the Mabiba family so would like respond it. to mm -hmm. me. And so I, I realized that the first time when we got to know each other, you know, to just take it very slowly mm. and not suddenly expect warmth and friendship and welcome, mm. but to actually mm. allow something to grow over time. Mm. And I think they've expressed their appreciation for, mm. for that. Mm. There was no sort of pressure on some kind of a quick intimacy. Yeah. We had the time. It's now five, six, seven years after mm. we, we've moved in. And, and it feels like something is becoming more and more mature in terms of our kind of friendship and mm. and that's precious and mm. and to get involved in the lives of the children mm. and and in their own lives and to have the three generations yeah. next door and then you know to be able to go and sit down with my emily mm. uh, while i was looking at my grandmother's diaries i realized like you were saying with rania yes i need to be open to that part of who i am or my family at least mm. But I also have to make sure that I balance that or make sure that that's framed by this larger story mm. of, of black pain mm. and what we're responsible for as white mm. South Africans. So, so I basically just sat down with my Emily and a lady was there for some of the time, but I wanted to speak to the oldest member of the family yes. who was alive in the mm. 50s and the 60s and the 70s. Mm. And she was just gracious to, mm. to share with me some of her life journey. Mm. And even though I've been a researcher within the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. I've read quite a bit, I've studied things quite a bit, I was involved with the ANC. Her, her kind of narrative, 
mm. the kind of nitty gritty details of an ordinary black woman trying mm. to navigate mm. the system and getting education for her children and mm. all of those constraints she had to deal with mm. because of the past law system and the whole racial mm. classification thing and forced it's removals, cool. you know. So through her experience, that mm. kind of side of apartheid became even more alive, mm. which then, of course, deepens my anger and my <laughs> frustration with, yeah. my, with my grandfather, but also with my family in Urania, that yeah. I feel we are not doing enough mm. to take responsibility for the pain that mm. we're responsible mm. for. I understand some of the cultural mm. concerns and that there needs to be a space for that. But my conversation with Carl is always, yes, I do want to hear your, your need for a mm. sense of belonging, mm. culturally speaking, but mm. what is the accompanying responsibility mm. Mm. that we have to address the legacy of, yeah, of apartheid? Yeah, and, and there we, you know, we have an open conversation uh, about it and we disagree, but, but mm. at least there is a willingness to have that mm. conversation. There was, interestingly enough, the, the daughter uh, mm. wasn't there yesterday. She's a student. She, but mm. They told Tabo, me that Tabo. they had, mm. she had great reservations yeah. about you yeah. until your book launch yeah. and she suddenly heard your story and she softened it. Mm. And so that, so that it was working just in case. Yeah, yeah. And I was particularly yeah. interested in that. No, Tebo is, uh, Tebo Petty is there as well, but Tebo was the, she just came out of PE, like Nelson Mandela University, being part of the fallest, mm. you know, period. Right. And I could sense from her, like, friendliness but a real sense of I'm not going to engage with you that I was a white male mm. middle-aged Afrikaner verwurt mm -hmm. and I basically respected mm. her mm. her mm. anger because I also have a, 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 some understanding at least why young people today would be so impatient and so frustrated mm. with the lack mm. of real progress mm. socioeconomically speaking mm. and so so I didn't expect her to come to the book launch and Africa Milani from you yeah, know yeah. Cape Talk, he did the interview, and I think that helped too. Yeah. And he was able to not compromise, you know, his, his criticism of her foot, but somehow make it into more of a human yeah, story. Absolutely. And again, so it was the mid. He was a midwife again. He almost facilitated the space yeah. for me to be able to talk about this yeah. in a way that I think somebody like Table could hear. Yeah. That this is not some kind of a whitewashing or a justification or an excuse, but that somehow this is an attempt to actually say, this is my embodiment, mm. this is who I am, what is my responsibility to make mm. a contribution to what's going on in South Africa? And, and I think that kind of restitutional humility and political mm. awareness, I think, is what mm. young people often feel is missing amongst mm. older white South Africans mm. or even young white South Africans who, mm. who tend not to... Well, take on the larger mm. historical mm. responsibility. I try and share my story and do the same thing, mm. but I've, you know, getting from some of my friends, particularly in, who are more in the EFF and client, and they said, we don't want to hear you. You talk about that whole thing of the perception of virtue signaling, which is what they mm. don't like, this mm. idea that somehow, yeah. okay, well, we've suffered, we've yeah. now made yeah. compensation. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, no, I think what, what, in a sense, has helped me to be linked to a prominent political figure mm is not to individualize mm. my political identity mm. too quickly, mm. but to remember that I'm also part of somebody who represents a system. Mm. So when a young black South African see me, no matter what I do, no matter what I say, they still see a white person. And that whiteness represents mm. the systemic mm. inequality and poverty that mm. we still see. Mm. And so that we have in our interactions this this intermingling of the individual and the personal and then the systemic. And of mm. course, as individuals, we want to be recognized as individuals, as John, mm. as Will Helen, and we want to have some kind of a w ability mm. to, to enter into relationship with that mm. individuality. Mm. And there is a place for that. Mm. But, but we need to be willing to go through a phase, I think, mm. of being humble about what our whiteness represents. But, I and, you you know, but Will Helen, you told me that 20 years ago, and you said it would probably take about 20 years yeah, before we got normal. Yeah, yeah. 20 years well, later, exactly. I no, in some sense, it's getting worse. In some <laughs> sense, I think it's the intergenerational, and having done some work in Northern Ireland yeah. for about 12 years, where, of course, you talk about 800 years of yeah. conflict, and where people say, you know, John Lederach and various other people would say, you know, the conflict transformation period is often the same period as the conflict. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so to almost have a recognition that we're talking here about uh, a longer mm -hmm. term. I mean, the idea of the 200 year present, mm -hmm. you know, I don't know if you're familiar with that, mm -hmm. but, mm -hmm. but so that you, you know, that we have these interge you know, intergenerational connections mm -hmm. and that the time mm -hmm. scale is bigger than I think mm -hmm. we also expected. Of course, what is 
added to the anger of the young black mm. South Africans is the disillusionment with their own leaders mm. and our generation of black South Africans. Well, let me ask you that because you know, I wanted to keep this at the spiritual level about reconciliation, incarnation, mm. or mysticism, and all that stuff. But, you know, my, I asked my Facebook friends, any questions you want me mm. to ask Phil Hallam? And the one, obviously, it came back to the political issue. Yeah. Because they said, okay, your, the subtitle of your book is My Journey Through Family Betrayal. In your book, you talk mm. about that one letter you received from mm. one of the guys who, who was, I think, more leftist Marxist person. He said, I can mm. see you making a sacrifice from one nationalism person, yeah. for another one. Are you jumping from out of yeah. the frying pan into the fire? Yeah. No, I mean, I, I, I really do struggle with, with my membership or my involvement in the ANC movement. Mm. Um, but I also have this big issue with white South Africans being almost too easily critical of what's wrong now. Mm -hmm. So there's a, if, if we are voicing our criticism, and we should, mm -hmm. if we combine that with some kind of historical awareness mm -hmm. and an acknowledgement that a lot of what is happening today has a connection to generations of mm -hmm. underinvestment in education, mm -hmm. systematic traumatization of human beings intergenerationally. So, so it's not as if we are disconnected from the, the mess that we see around us. Mm -hmm. And also, what am I doing in terms of my own responsibility to address mm. these things. So what I have a problem with is people in middle class circles pointing fingers mm. with sometimes a, almost like a glee of, yes. of, mm. of enjoyment, you know, that... Yeah, that, you yeah. You so, know, so that's what I have a problem with. Yes. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't mm. be very critical of what's going on. Mm. But mm. as a white South African from my age group, mm. I just find I need to be quite humble mm. at the same time. Mm. And that I can look back and say it took me more than 20 years before I really started to wake up to what mm. was going on in South Africa. I was not that critical of the previous regime. Mm. How, on what basis can I now be critical of the current regime mm. unless I also take responsibility mm. for mm. my involvement? And, and it's that what I, what I, what mm. I have a problem with. Mm. Um, not the criticism as such, but, but what, is com what is added to the criticism. Mm. But say, lastly, to kind of wrap up, because I'm we all into this word sustainability, mm. we think of an ecological and economic, but there's something, spiritual sustainability. Well, for me, and I did refer to it a bit earlier on, the, the, the joy that I'm experiencing mm. often is that, that my core beliefs, my core sense of what it means to be a Christian actually is becoming much more real. The more I go into this stuff, mm. the more I'm engaging, the more I'm grappling mm. with things, the more it feels like actually, mm. this is actually good news. Mm. Uh, and that it is possible to, to take up your cross and mm. it feels like dying, but in the process, it's the doorway to new life. And that's what I'm now trying to convey also for young people that, mm. yes, it feels difficult and it feels like you're being overwhelmed and so mm. on, but we need to find a way to make this mm. central to our faith journey. Mm. Yeah. And to actually say, if you look back to the first century Palestine, I mean, this was highly <laughs> politicized, violent conflict setting. It wasn't a white Jesus with a, you know, like a crucifixion for an ornament. It was mm. pretty powerful, yeah. radical stuff to love your enemy in that mm. context. Mm. And so it's almost like it makes our, mm. the, the chance mm. is there for us to mm. rediscover our mm. faith and to actually come alive mm. more fully. And that's yeah. the approach that I've experienced. And it came about because of those relationships mm. with, with fellow mm. Christians, fellow black South Africans. Mm. And, yeah. and that's where Ubuntu for me is, is the core yeah. message. And that mm. really is the body of Christ, you know, yeah. that we are in this yeah. deep, interconnected mm. relationship with each other. Where to from here? I mean, you told me that you wrote, this is the first time writing this book in Afrikaans, after your last book was in Afrikaans, and you found it difficult ago. 20 yeah. years ago. I mean, the, the reason why I wrote the, the book really was to do what the young black South Africans were challenging me to do, mm. to say, what white work are, are you willing to do? You know, are you willing to be part of the raising of political mm. and historical awareness in your own community? so that we have more restitutional responsibility. Mm -hmm. Why should we do all of that work? Mm -hmm. And so I've written the book and in a kind of family story way to hopefully draw people into a, mm. a story of all of us. You know, it's, mm. it's prominent because of the family name, but, but I don't think the story is that mm. unique. Mm. And that all of us, I think, have this opportunity to step into mm. this pain, mm. into the discomfort, to take up, as it were, our cross, mm. 
and become more fully alive as human beings. And that's mm. the image of homecoming, you know, mm. to come home in my skin and in my kin mm. uh, and in my face uh, mm. and in my humanity. Mm. Uh, and that somehow, I think that kind of inspirational message is what we need to get mm. across. It's not this kind mm. of party political, moral badgering mm. of mm. just talking about the evils of apartheid mm. and how bad white people are. You know, like that language doesn't always mm. invite people on a transformational mm. journey. Mm. And so I'm hoping that these books actually would mm. convey mm. something mm. along those lines. Well, thank you, Wilhelm. What comes to mind as you talk about that is Ken Wilber's lovely, simple way of putting it. He talks about first we must show up, then we must clean up, then we must grow up, and then we must wake up. And I just feel extraordinarily grateful mm. to you mm. for prevailing there because you've helped sort of inspire mm. me and I hope mm. a lot more people to mm. be there and to be awake. Mm.